So, externalizing conversations, as you saw, aim to separate the problem from the person and to create some distance between them that allows some space to emerge around the person, all right? So that the person can use this space to develop a new way of relating to the problem, as you saw in the black dog story. Okay, so the relationship shifted. This new space can now foster a realization that the person is more than the problem, rather than being engulfed or completely defined by it. When you think about it really, and perhaps after becoming a bit more familiar with externalizing conversations, you will realize that such conversations are an opportunity for seeing how the issue or the problem affects the person's life and what mechanisms it uses to dominate the person's life. If you remember seeking exceptions, now this idea intersects quite well with that skill of looking for exceptions or exceptional conversations in solution-focused therapy. Because as you get into a rich exploration of how the problem is controlling this person's life, you start to see places where it doesn't have as much control. And these are exactly those exceptional times or circumstances. These are opportunities that we could get into points of entry and kind of expand the person's story of exceptional times. These are times when the person has more power. And there we go. We intended to thicken those moments and circumstances to open more similar spaces in the life of this person. And so I hope that by the end of this mini lecture, and after I outline the steps that are involved in the path for externalizing conversations, you can see that such conversations hope and aim to change the way problems are perceived, understood, and experienced, and also change the client's views about the options that they have for living a different life and perhaps engaging in different actions. So one thing that is very important to consider is to realize that this is not a technique to do it once and be done with it. You can't really follow on with externalizing conversations if you really believe that someone is depressed or that someone is suffering from whatever disorder, such as, I don't know, bipolar disorder or even a schizophrenia, if in your mind you have such presuppositions about the person, your efforts in facilitating an externalizing conversation would appear superficial, and you might even say other things at a later point in your work with people that completely destroy all that you have done in separating the person from the problem. Our view, when we want to facilitate externalizing conversations, is genuinely that it doesn't matter what diagnosis people have. Instead, our task is to reduce the degree to which the diagnosis has been internalized. And by doing so, we aim to reduce the influence of the problem, all right, or completely remove the effects of the problem from this person's life. So as you begin talking about the problem in this externalized way, and this is after you and the client together decide on an appropriate name for it, you should stick to that way of speaking about the problem and don't change back into that socially imposed and internalized way of talking about the problem after that point. As you start referring to the problem using a name that you and the client chose together, you begin a journey that you follow carefully and with passion and with a spirit of adventure, as David Epstein always put it, you will achieve a number of things. The first thing is that the problem becomes objectified and soon disempowered. It is hanging around those notion that whatever has been objectified in our society moves in the direction of disempowerment. It decreases the sense of guilt and shame or blame that the person might have been experiencing so far, because after all, it is the problem who is the troublemaker. Now, such externalizing ways of speaking about the problem eventually open pathways for actions that haven't been visible so far. And you will see that as a result of following the steps that shape externalizing conversations, I'll outline them shortly, cooperative efforts emerge. And these cooperative efforts are not just between you and the client, but could be between the client 
and other significant, other important people in their lives, such as their partners, their parents, their friends, their family members. And before I move on further to the next slide, I just want to raise the point that this paper by Maggie Carey that you can access from our library could really help you see some examples or particular ways of utilizing externalizing conversations in working with children mostly, but obviously it doesn't limit itself to working with children and can be used with adults as well. Okay, now we're getting to the practical parts a bit more. How do we actually do it? How do we engage clients in externalizing conversations? Where do we begin? Where do we end? Where are we going? I must confess that this mini lecture is very short. It's a very short opportunity for me to do justice and outline all there is to externalizing conversations. I'll try. We could really spend a whole day on this and it's still there would be other things to attend to. But I will just briefly outline these four steps that are called the first statement of position map in utilizing externalizing conversations. There's a second statement of position map that is also used after these initial steps are covered, uh, perhaps after a number of sessions of working with people. But that, that second statement of position map, again, will be beyond this course. What are the four steps that are covered here in the first statement of position map to utilize externalizing conversations in an efficient and impactful way? We begin by characterizing the problem which is about first finding a name for the problem and then adding some more details around that, uh, details that we gather from the client's perspective. So this will be about characterization of the problem in an experience near way. That's what we call it, experience near. Once we achieve that to a good degree, we move into the next step, which is about mapping the effects of the problem in this person's life. What happened? And what sort of things led to the development and emergence of this problem in this person's life? What are the sort of histories and antecedents to this problem? In what context the problem operates more and disrupts this person's life more than other contexts? In what domains or with what other people, in what sort of relational context or groups of people it becomes more active and persuasive, for example? And after we cover those to a full extent, then we move into a third category or inquiry, which is now about evaluating these effects of the problem. We want the person to engage in tasks of richly describing their experience of those effects and evaluate their positions on those effects. In a nutshell, at this point, we want to ask the person if all these effects are okay with them. We might ask things like, how do you feel about this? How is this by you? Where do you stand on this? All right, we will talk more about this. And then once we help the person to develop a firm position on the effects of the problem in their life, we can then inquire about the justifications of these evaluations. This might sound a bit strange at first, but you will see later what this does at that stage. We want to really ask the person why is or isn't one effect okay for them. Why do you feel this way about such effects of the problem in your life? Okay, now I'll briefly go through each of these four steps to clarify them a bit more and provide more examples. Okay, step one. The first step is pretty straightforward. It was all about finding a name for the problem, characterization of the problem. Um, some analogy that might help is that if you remember the empty chair technique, you can now imagine that you're about to ask the problem to sit on that chair and you and the client get into the task of looking at it and exploring its tactics and operations and ways of troublemaking in this person's life. So we intend to give the problem a sort of persona. To do this, some people, some clients might readily use metaphors in describing their problems in that first session as you hear them talk about what brings them to therapy, all right? So you might be able to actually use those metaphors for proposing names and inquiring more about the characters of the problem. If not, you can ask other kind of questions to characterize the problem. You can ask things like, is it dark or is it large? Is it always around or only sometimes? How is its presence? Is it like a control freak or someone who suddenly appears out of nowhere? 
Is it loud or is it whispering? What type of problem is it? If someone says, for example, my problem is ADHD, you could ask, what type of ADHD is it? Is it, is it like a black ADHD or a white ADHD? Is it a light one or a heavy one? All right. Um, is it wandering around heavily and bulky? All sorts of characterizations are valuable at this point and really helpful. Once the problem is characterized well, we can start moving into the second phase of these conversations. Now, this step is all about exploration of the effects of the problem in our client's life, or what is referred to as mapping the effects of the problem. Now, this mapping occurs through an exploration of the various domains of this person's life in which complications are identified, all right? Could be home, workplace, school, peer context, familiar relationships, relationship with oneself, friendship, purposes, hopes, desires, aspirations, plans, all right? So it could be different, very different things and, you know, things related to future possibilities, all sorts of things. What actually is achieved through this step is about providing a full acknowledgement of the effects of the problem in different domains of this person's life and also to situate the problem in time, in various relationships, and actually in the context of this person's life, to situate the problem in context. Major areas that you can work and explore relate to how the problem actually impacts uh, this person's relationship with various significant others, or the impacts of the problem on our client's feelings, or what are its effects on the kind of a story they're able to tell about themselves or how it has the client treating their own life, you know? Remember that every question you ask, instead of the phrase, the problem, you actually need to use the name you agreed on in the previous step, all right? So these are some example questions. Once the effect of the problem has been fully acknowledged and placed in its context, we get to the next step which is all about evaluation of the effects or influence of the problem in those life domains that we just explored. We do this to help the person develop a position on those effects. As I said, this might appear to be a simple thing now, and a lot of us take it for granted that people obviously don't like and don't want those effects of the problem in their life. Mm -hmm. Well, what is important is to just actually follow on here and ask these questions that might even surprise the clients. And that is exactly one point of asking such questions and having such curiosities or asking of such questions and the position of the person about the effects of the problem might surprise some clients because they assume we intend to go on the business of telling them, look how bad the effects are. Or for example, like many other people in their environment, we also want to make a point of, look what an undesired effects this problem has in your life. In fact, we engage in asking questions and show these sorts of curiosities, showing what is known as a position of not knowing to highlight the expertise of the person in their life. As opposed to engage them in the process of developing a position in relation to the externalized problem, to story their intentions and values in such a way that helps them stand against the effects of the problem. So we can ask these kind of example questions here at this stage. Is this okay with you? What is meant here is that we are asking, is this effect of the problem okay for you? I mean, imagine your client has got to a point of explaining to you that the problem has had an impact in their social life. And one of its effects has been that the client is not any more able to go out with her friends, for example. All right. Now, you're asking the client at this stage if this not being able to go out with friends OK with the person. You see what I mean here by asking a question on the position of the person? And you see in what ways asking of this question might be surprising, 
Because people tend to assume that if they tell us about this effect of the problem, this not being able to go out with friends, we know of their position on the matter. But we don't actually, do we? What do you know about their position on this? Do we always assume this much? No, perhaps we shouldn't. So let's ask the person about their position on this effect and be curious, remain curious, because this kind of curiosity will now open ways for people to talk about, to story their preferences in life, to story aspects of their hope, desires and values. We'll talk about this in the next step, but some of the other example questions that we have for evaluation of the effects of the problem and helping people develop a position on these effects um, could be like these. Where do you stand on this? What is your position on this? Is this a positive or negative development? Or would you say both a positive and a negative development? Or neither of these? Or would you say in an in-between sort of development? And so on. And when you ask those kind of questions, then you can follow on and explore a bit more what they mean, why do they say that, all right? So that's the next step. Okay, now, once we have their evaluation on those effects, once we have the person's position on the effects of the problem, we need to ask some why questions. And this is perhaps the only kind of time that we engage in asking why questions. In many ways and in many other circumstances, especially in our first meeting with people, we must avoid asking why questions. But perhaps here is one of those very exceptional times that after we have gone this much into externalizing conversations, we can ask some very specific why questions. These are not any why questions. These are why questions that invite the person specifically to justify their position on those effects of the problem that they just outlined through the previous step. Justification of the evaluations of the effects. All right. We now can invite the person through some further curious questions to tell us why they don't like or prefer these effects in their life. Now, asking these kind of questions invite the person to tell us about various values, desires, hopes, commitments, or plans they might have in their life. Okay. This results in the person starting to tell the stories of their personal values or things that are really, really important in their life, as opposed to what the problem might have brought forward for them. Following on that client example, all right, that I just used in the previous step, uh, if you remember, I asked her about her position on one of the effects of the problem, which was not being able to go out with her friends. Once we inquire on her position about the effects of the problem, she said something like this. Of course I don't like this. This is really not something that I wanted or imagined would ever happen in my life. This whole thing is very strange as it was completely fine for me to go out with people. Once we have this kind of a position a statement from a client, we want to be very curious about such an evaluation of the effects. He would ask her something around the lines of, why isn't this okay for you? Why is that you don't like this? And again, the client might be surprised, and that is our intention, because they may assume we know why they don't like this, but we don't, and we want them to tell us. And this is the point where they start telling you stories of hope, possibility, values, commitments, and plans. Obviously, depending on client's answer to such questions, we could ask further questions to really thicken their storytelling, to really help them expand on such values that they bring up and tell us about. We want to learn about things that are really important for this person in relation to those effects. And what is it that the problem is blocking for them or making it challenging for them in relation to those values and hopes that they want to achieve and get closer? And to close this mini lecture, I want to just briefly highlight that externalizing conversations is just the beginning of the work that narrative therapy highlights and introduces in a new and invigorating way. There's this whole new perspective on people, problems, and what we can do in our therapeutic work with people. And it often involves a huge amount of creativity and breaking away 
from the structures that might have historically limited us in counseling work. Here, I have only very briefly touched on these two first stages of narrative therapy work in this mini lecture. And there are a whole lot of other activities and strategies that could be used following from what valuable work you have done so far through externalizing conversations and what was explained as four steps described in the first statement of position map. Once the problem is fully characterized, its history and traces are explored and its effects mapped out, once we have some evaluation on the effects of the problem, and once we work to expand on the justification that people provide, we move into the second statement of position map, which helps us to highlight and bring to the foreground what is known as unique outcomes or exceptional circumstances. And then after that, we get into practices through which a new and alternative story is more fully developed to replace the problem story and result in an expansion of stories of possibility and new forms of action in people's lives. Now, if you're interested to learn a bit more about narrative therapy and its practices, there's a free online course that could help a bit more with your learning. And I've included a link to that online course under this mini lecture. Good luck.